All right, this video is gonna be the first of a series of videos investigating isoparametric quadrilateral elements. And the first part, we're gonna investigate what the heck are natural coordinates, that's this xi and eta that we have drawn within this element, and what the Jacobian matrix is, and how it is able to map between this element's natural coordinate system and global coordinates. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start with some basic information about the isoparametric quadrilateral element. All right, so there it is. There's our four node isoparametric quadrilateral element. And four nodes, two degrees of freedom per node, just like our triangle element, our constant strain triangle element had two degrees of stiffness per element, or per, per node, pardon me. So does the quadrilateral element. Now, one major difference is that the quadrilateral element has a shear flexibility term, which means that it can converge more quickly than the constant strain triangle element. Also, the irregular shape allows the element to adapt to most surfaces. So we could make plain rectangular elements that don't have this funny natural coordinate system, but they wouldn't be able to map very well to irregular surfaces. So what's nice about this element is it can adapt to most surfaces like a constant strain triangle element can, but because it has this additional shear flexibility term, it actually is able to converge more quickly than this constant strain triangle element. So that's one major advantage. All right, now, as we mentioned on, at the beginning, we have these two coordinate system types, our global coordinate system that we're familiar with a natural coordinate system that we are just investigating now, and this Jacobian matrix that is used to map between both of these. All right, so first we could ask, what is the shear flexibility term? And if we take a look at our horizontal displacement of an element, in this case we're gonna use a quadrilateral element, we can have our translation, why well, that's the same as what we could have with a triangle element we can have displacement that varies with x just like a triangle element we can have displacement that varies with y just like a triangle element and a triangle element at this point this is all the possible methods of deformation that it can possibly have for a linear triangle element but with a quadrilateral element we can have something that varies with both x and y and so if we have something that varies with both x and y that gives us the shear flexibility term that is not available in the constant strain triangle element. So that's what we're talking about, this term right here. All right, let's look at this a little bit more with the shear flexibility term. And we're gonna talk about why it allows for linear variation in stress and strain. So once again, these are the displacement functions. We have the displacement function in the x direction, u, displacement function in the y direction, v, have our shear flexibility terms there. And because of those shear flexibility terms, when we take the derivative of our displacement functions, we have terms that vary. So the displacement in x can vary in the y direction. The displacement in y can vary in x. The shear strain can vary in x and y. All right, and so this gives us our Hooke's law formation here. We have our stress vector, our strain vector, constitutive matrix, and the reason that this is drawn is just to emphasize that just like our strain can vary in X and Y, so can our stress for these types of elements. All right, so the next question might be, what the heck are natural coordinates? What are these things? And we're going to start with showing what our general stiffness matrix equation is for a two-dimensional element. Okay, all have this form. We were able to simplify it for the constant strain triangle element because everything was constant inside of it. That's not going to be the case with these elements. But we'll start with this equation. It's the same formation. And when we look at the isoparametric element, we see that it's not a very regular shape. And so if we looked at this integration here, it'd be rather difficult to figure out what those limits of integration would be. 
So instead of worrying about that, we introduce natural coordinates. And these natural coordinates are fractional distances. So if we go ahead and write out our element here with our natural coordinates, at each of the nodes, notice how it's either negative one or one. And so I say fractional distance, it's really fractional distance from the center of the element to each of these edges, right? So here it's a much longer distance from the center of the element to the node two, but that fractional distance is still gonna be from zero to one in the xi direction. Same exact as what we have up here, even though this is a much shorter, shorter edge, right? That fractional distance from xi equals zero to one is still the same, right? So, so it's fractional distances throughout the element. Here's the beauty of that, it simplifies the stiffness matrix equation. So now, instead of having this type of integration, where we don't know what our limits of integration are, we go ahead and make this substitution. Now we keep this integration in terms of our natural coordinates, and they just go between negative one and one, right? And this is all possible due to this Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix is the mapping mechanism between our natural coordinate system and our global coordinate system. And so the equation for the Jacobian matrix is as follows. Note that it's the derivative of each of our positions here, x, y direction, with our natural coordinates, xi and eta. All right, let's look at this in a little bit more detail on this slide. So here's our Jacobian matrix, and it's determined from the position functions, and those position functions include the nodal coordinates and the shape functions. All right, there's our position function for x, right? We can essentially say the position, or pardon me, the position x anywhere throughout the element is equal to the shape function for node one times the position at node one, the shape function for node two times the position for node two, and so on all the way to the fourth node. Same as the y direction. And so if that's the case, there we go. There's all our global coordinates written there. We know that these are all written in terms of, all the shape functions are written in terms of xi and eta. Well, I guess you could say, do we know that? We haven't covered them yet. We haven't covered shape functions yet for the isoparametric element. So let's go ahead and do that right now. <laughs> all right, shape functions. All right, the shape function, the definition for a shape function is always the same. It's one at the degree of freedom it corresponds to, and it's zero at all the other ones, right? So for these nodal shape functions, it's gonna be one at whatever node it represents, and it's gonna be zero at all the other nodes, right? And the polynomial style of these shape functions is going to take the same form as those displacements that we looked at earlier. All right, so now if we can imagine that our element is lying in this xi eta plane, and this vertical axis is the shape function axis, we can kind of draw a representation of these shape functions. So the shape function for node one, it would be equal to one at node one. Oops, already drew that one. Let's go right back to this one. It'd be one at node one, it would be zero at all the other nodes, right? So we have as i equals minus one, eta equals minus one, that would be two times two, that'd be four, we would go ahead and divide by four to give us one at node one. There we go, now we can go to node two. Similar looking type of shape function, similar type looking form. The only difference is, is that now this shape function is equal to one when xi is equal to one and eta is equal to minus one. And we get similar forms for node three and node four. All right, so these are the shape functions that we have for our linear four node isoparametric quadrilateral element. So now we can go ahead and combine what we know about the Jacobian matrix and what we know about the position functions that include 
the shape functions and the nodal coordinates to do something like this. We're essentially just taking derivatives of those equations for our position functions, right? We're just, we're just taking derivatives of it. Well, our nodal coordinates, those are going to be the same. So we just essentially take derivatives of the shape functions with respect to xi. First here, so we're going to take a look at this first, this first element in the upper left corner here. We can expand this matrix in terms of these two matrix equations. So first row here multiplied by this first column would give us that value there. We have the value up here in the upper right corner. We could get that by multiplying this first row of that matrix by the second column there. We go ahead and add the second row of that matrix multiplied by the first column. That gives us that element right there that was just highlighted with the blue box. And we get our last purple box by just multiplying that bottom row with that second column. And so that becomes the equation for our Jacobian matrix. We're going to go ahead and substitute the derivatives for the shape functions. There we go. Here are our shape functions that we had previously. Take the derivative of each one with respect to xi. Take the derivative of each one with respect to eta. And so we can go ahead and take that same Jacobian matrix equation that we had on the previous slide and we can go ahead and make those substitutions based off of what we have in this table and when we go ahead and do that we get our equation for the Jacobian matrix ta-da all right now that we have that equation for the Jacobian matrix, we want to make a quick note, or I want to make a quick note about what, or, or probably how the Jacobian matrix relates to element quality and using something called the Jacobian ratio. And you would see that in uh, many commercial finite element codes. They use the Jacobian matrix as a way to determine element quality, essentially making sure that this element isn't so skewed that the results of it wouldn't really be worthwhile and in fact it caused serious problems sometimes so what the Jacobian ratio does is it takes the determinant of the Jacobian matrix at each node it evaluates it at each node and the Jacobian ratio is just the ratio of the minimum value of the determinant at one of those nodes divided by the maximum value so ideally, the Jacobian ratio would be one. You'd have the same, that would be the case if you had a perfect square, for example. Now, it's rarely a perfect square because we have weird surfaces that we're trying to map these elements to. And so, in general though, we do want that Jacobian ratio to be greater than 0.3 for almost all elements, uh, especially in regions of concern where, or regions where you have a lot of stress variation. So that's that's where it's most important to have good quality elements. And there's many ways to determine element quality. The Jacobian ratio though is one of the more popular ones. With that, we have our reflection questions. The first reflection question we have is, why do quadrilateral elements converge more quickly than the constant strain triangle elements or those CST elements? The next one is, what is the purpose of natural coordinates? Next we have, how are shape functions developed for the isoparametric quadrilateral element? Our fourth question is, what is the purpose of the Jacobian matrix? And our fifth and final question is, how can the Jacobian matrix be used to determine element quality? So that very last slide before we got to the reflection question slide. Okay, well this should conclude part one of our discussion on isoparametric quadrilateral elements. And so this part one, investigating the Jacobian matrix and natural coordinates.